We're in the about a third of the way through a series on the coming of the Lord called the appearance, the appearance a second time. He shall appear the second time without sin and the salvation. That is the second time on earth. Did you know that Hebrews, the ninth chapter, records three appearances of Christ? The 21st, 4th verse, verse says, Now he's appearing in the presence of God for us. The 26th verse says, Once in the end of the world he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself, referring to his death. And verse 28 says, To them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin, or not to deal with sin shall appear without sin mm -hmm. and then they're looking for him so we're talking about that particular appearance which is the next one to occur on earth and if you're taking advantage of his first appearing and have as the scripture states receive the atonement and if you are taking advantage of this of the appearance that's going on now where he's interceding for us because he ever lives to make intercession for those who come to God by Him, then you have nothing to fear with this with the next appearing. Amen. That's right. Uh, but if you haven't availed yourself of the first appearing, now it does not be ambiguous about this at all. This this next appearing will there be not one speck of good that will come from it for you. If you are if Jesus is not interceding for you now, you, you don't stand a whisper of a hope when He comes again. Mm -hmm. But of course, there's uh, there's no reason for anybody to be in that condition. We rejoice in it. Now tonight I want to deal with the disruption of the natural order when Jesus comes again. He's going to come in all of His glory. All of it. Luke says He's also going to come in His Father's glory. And all the glory of all the angels. That's a lot of glory, let me tell you. So don't think for one moment that the heavens and the earth will be able to survive that. They will not. The overall text is taken from 2 Peter, the third chapter, verses 10 through 12. Now, this, this is a very plain text, but notwithstanding it's necessary to, to read it, there's an enormous amount of theology that acts like this isn't in the Bible. <laughs> but it is. It is there. Now, this refers to the time when Jesus will come as a thief in the night. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise. The earth also and the works of their end shall be burned up. It says the elements will melt with fervent heat. That's just what's going to happen. They're going to be dissolved, he was about to say. Now Christ coming as a thief, that is that the thief means it's, it's unexpected for those that are in the, of the night. He said, we are not of the night. When you're in Christ, you're walking in the day. We're not children of the night. But he's telling you, this, for, for anyone who's not living for Christ, this coming will be as a thief. The same coming will be a blessed one for those that are waiting. It, like the, the same time the five foolish versions were locked out, the five wives, what wives were locked in. How about that? <laughs> same coming. Now this is of special interest to those that are in Christ because faith makes you a stranger in the world. Faith makes you a misfit in this world. Now there's, a, there's quite a bit of activity in the church world trying to get people to fit in with the world. They kind of look like it, talk like it, act like it. And you can hardly tell who's in, who's out. You can't. This is like not from God at all. Scripture tells us of the old patriarchs lived a long time ago that lived by faith. It said that they confessed they were strangers and pilgrims in the earth. They just didn't fit in. And Peter admonishes us, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts that war against the soul. Fleshly lusts are desires that pin you to the earth. That they kind of anchors you down here. So the earth's what you think about. The earth's what you live for. You live just like this is it. But this isn't it. Amen. And that's why it's necessary to talk about these things. Because the earth's going to pass away. Heaven and the earth will pass away. That's what Jesus said. So you can't afford to be attached to it. 
Amen. You've got to live a detached life. We're in it. I understand that we're in it. But we're not of it. Now let's look for a moment and look at the world order or the universe or the creation, however you want to state it. Scripture reminds us that when the Lord created the heavens and the earth, in Genesis 1.31, it says, The Lord saw everything that he'd made, and behold, it was very good. Amen. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So this was a good job. Everything is very good. However, when sin entered into the world, it changed things. Sin emitted a sort of virus into the universe. Mm -hmm. Kind of like a spiritual virus. It contaminated everything. Even in the contaminated state, however, the scriptures tell us that nature is like lisping a testimony. It's kind of vague. <laughs> it's really not all that clear. But it's emitting this testimony. Psalm 19, 1 through 3 says... <clears throat> The heavens declare the glory of, the, of God, and the firmament showeth forth his handiwork. Day unto day utter speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language, for their voice is not heard. So the universe is like speaking. First chapter of Romans, the 20th verse, says his power and Godhead or divinity are clearly seen in the creation. <laughs> But nobody in all of the history of mankind, nobody has ever gotten the message except the people God showed it to. Now you check through scripture and see if that's not true. No one has ever studied the stars and found the true God. No one has ever studied the sun or the universe or the trees or the flowers and got a valid concept about God. The only people that have ever known about God are the people God's revealed himself to. Amen. That that is it. Everyone else, as Romans 1 tells you, settled for lesser gods. They didn't retain God in their knowledge. And they gave credit to four-footed beasts and to man and think that God just wasn't known. Why wasn't it? Because nature has been blinded by sin. So even its testimony is not, is not all that clear. I had had a discussion with a group of people, ministers actually. I don't know how they got to be ministers, but they were. And they were discussing about how God, you could get a lot of information about God external to Scripture. So I called for somebody to produce one thought one valid thought that anybody has ever had about God that didn't come from the Bible. Well, it's like nobody heard my question for a long time. But I pressed this. I want, we, we, we've been saying now that there's a lot of sources of knowledge about God. I want to... One valid thought, any thought, no matter how small it is, one valid thought about God that did not derive its source from the Bible. Finally, one man said, in nature, you see the power and divinity of God. I said, where did you find that out? You'd have never known that if God hadn't said that. <laughs> Sin caused this. This is my point. Sin has caused this so that nature can't, like, speak with a clear voice. If you don't know God, you're not, like, getting the message. Once you know God, you can see a lot of things in, in nature. I understand that. But the point is you have to know the Lord before you can recognize mm -hmm. these things. Sin has caused this condition. As a result, nature is no longer an appropriate object of our attention. In fact, it has actually become a domain of competition for the knowledge of God from man's viewpoint. Scripture tells us, and I'm, what I'm showing here, is that nature was created, it was, it was altogether good. Nothing was wrong with it at all. But when sin entered into the world, it changed the whole arena of nature. And nature has to go. Where man lives has to go. It has to go. Because in God's sight, nothing contaminated can enter in. If God does himself doesn't get rid of the contamination, it's not going to go. 
That's why man has to be born again. You have to start again. God's not in the business of polishing people up and reforming them. He, he gives new life and changes things. He's going to do the same thing to the creation, is my point. 2 Corinthians 4.18 says, We look not at the things that are seen. That is, we don't focus on them. What do you mean? We don't focus on things that are seen, but on things that are not seen. Back in the primitive, spiritually primitive times of Job, it is written in Job 15.15, 15, that even the heavens aren't pure in his sight. See, it's been, it's been contaminated. The environment has been contaminated. And it's a domain of competition. Now, now Hose, uh, Isaiah speaks of, of how men have regarded nature, na nature, and it's quite remarkable. He said that there are astrologers, stargazers, monthly prognosticators. That is, they derive their religion from nature. Now, we refined it in our day into horoscopes and things like this, but def they're defining God by nature and trusting in it, and, and God condemns that practice. He condemns that practice completely. I'm showing here that nature has now become an arena of competition so that men can study nature and think, think that stars are determining the future of men and that the position of heavenly bodies is what determines who you are and what you do and where you go. That, but that's a wholly erroneous conclusion. Sin has blighted nature. In fact, God told Adam he cursed the ground for man's sake. Now, God has promised that nature is going to be renewed. It is going to be re regenerated. And we have, uh, it's been groaning for a long time under the weight of mortality. And if you will listen in nature, if you're at some place where you're away from the sounds of earth, you can almost hear the groans of, of nature under the burden of mortality. Romans, the 8th chapter, says this in verse 18. The earnest expectation of the creature or creation is waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. <laughs> I've heard people say, I never feel as close to God as was I when I'm in nature. Well, this is, uh, this is not uh, an accurate appraisal at all. Nature's looking at us. Yes. <laughs> it's just actually it's the other way around. Nature's looking and waiting for the manifestation of the children of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, it's dying, not willingly, that is, God didn't condemn creation because of anything it did, not willingly, but by reason of him who subjected the same in hope. That's God's passed the sentence of death upon the universe so he can <coughs> renew it and bring it back again. Amen. Verse 21 says, The creature itself also shall be delivered from bondage of the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. And we know that the whole creation groans and travails and pain together until now. So there, all creations can just longing and waiting for when the sons of God are unveiled. See, now we're, we're incognito. <laughs> the people of God are in disguise right now. And the universe is waiting when they're opened up. And we're like Jesus when we see him as he is. Then the creation is going to be liberated from mortality. Now God promised in this uh, in this mortality, making things new, that the creation as we know it now will be destroyed. As we know it now. The scripture says this quite frequently. Hear the testimony of the Lord here. Psalm 102. Of old, thou hast laid the foundation of the earth and the heavens of the work of thy hands. They shall perish. Thou shalt endure. Here's Isaiah 24, 20. Prophets make this clear. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard and shall be removed like a cottage and the transgression thereof shall fall heavy upon it and it shall fall and not rise again. Mm, amen. Again, Isaiah 51, 6. Lift up your eyes to the heavens. Look upon the earth beneath. For the heavens shall vanish away like smoke, the earth shall wax old like a garment. They that dwell therein shall die in like manner, but my salvation shall be forever, and my righteousness shall not be abolished. Amen. So whatever you think about the heavens and the earth, study them. We bid you to study them, ponder them. <coughs> and when you've done pondering, remember, they shall pass away. 
Matthew 24, 35, Jesus makes this statement, Heaven and earth shall pass away. I mean, you can't say it any plainer. John says in 1 John 2, 17, The world passes away, and the lust thereof. So the scriptures are quite clear about the destiny of all the universe and everyone in it. Scripture tells us that the the only solution is a new creation. That's the only solution. Now, we, you in Christ Jesus, if you're in Christ, you are newly created. You're an example of something God does where the blight of sin has caused a curse. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things pass away, new things, and behold, all things become new. This is going to happen in the universe. Now, let's look at the logic the logic of the earth and the heavens and the earth passing away. There's a certain reasoning behind this. Moral defilement excludes people or things from God's presence. Now it does. Whatever person may think about sin and iniquity, if you can't get rid of it, you'll never be with God. It, it's got to be gotten rid of. Now here's the point that we want to make. Because the earth has been contaminated, because the heavens have been contaminated, the scripture says they're not clean in his sight. It's just a categorical statement of scripture. Then they have to be made new. And the condition they're in, they've got to pass away. <clears throat> you recall that there were some angels that fell from the presence of the Lord, Jude 6, tell me about them. <coughs> The angels that left their habitation and lost their first estate, they were, speaking as a man, as close to God as you could get. So, and they became defiled. They fell. They left their habitation. What happened? They were excluded from the presence of God. And they can't get back in. Because they fell from the presence. You sinned. You can get back because you sinned when you were away from God in the first place. But these angels sin from the presence of God. They can't get back. Mm -hmm. The point I'm making is that defilement has, it, we have to get rid of it. Mm -hmm. I think if people saw the necessity of the remission of sin, it would dramatically change how people responded to preaching if they heard good preaching. Mm -hmm. but somehow this idea is coming across in the modern church world. This idea is coming across that sin's really not all that bad is really not really that serious. So the church has like toned down its message and turned, toned down its posture so it tolerates sin. Listen, God will not tolerate sin. Amen. There can't anything defiled enter into His presence. The earth's defiled is going to have to go as it presently is. This statement is made in 1 Corinthians 15.50. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Now it can't. It just can't. A person can philosophize about it all they want. It can't because it's contaminated. This is why Jesus said you must be born again. Whatever is born of the flesh is flesh. Adam couldn't have a dog and a horse couldn't have it. Couldn't have Cain. That's just the way it was. What's born of flesh is flesh. What's born of spirit is spirit. And if you don't become a spiritual creation in Christ Jesus, you're just excluded. That's just, just cut and dried. There's nothing to negotiate. That's how it is. That's why Christ came to make provision for that renewal. Now the natural order is contaminated, so it has to be removed. Revelation 21.1 like projects you to the end of time. And John says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. <coughs> so in God's economy, something new can't come till the old has gone. Mm -hmm. That's how it works. The new covenant couldn't come till the old covenant was gone. You couldn't be a new creation till the old person was gone. The new heavens and new earth won't appear till the old are gone. So this is the way, this is how God works. If you want something fresh from God, you have to get rid of what's stale. It just has to go. That's the way God's going to work. 
in the new creation. Now the nature of the kingdom of God is progressive. That is, it's just not cut and dried that God's going to eliminate the old and bring in the new. He's actually preparing people for this now. You, you, when this happens, you've got to be ready. This, this will not be a time when you get ready. Everyone understands that, I'm sure. When the Lord Jesus comes, it's, there's going to be no amends made at that time. No one's character is going to change at that time. What, what becoming a child of God, being born again, being regenerated, being justified by faith, what it's all about is getting you ready for this time. That's the rationale behind becoming a Christian. The rationale of being a child of God or coming into Christ is not just clean up your life here. That's not the rationale. The rationale is this place is going. And a new order is coming. And you've got to be ready when it arrives. So he's changing you now to fit into this new environment. Marvelous to consider. So the new heavens and the new earth demand the removal of the old. Isaiah 65, 17 makes this statement. Behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered nor come into mind. <laughs> what a thought. Isaiah 66, 22 says, A new heavens and a new earth will I make, and they shall remain before me. I'm going to make a new one. 2 Peter 3.13, we according to the promise look for a new heavens and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness. And the preceding verse says it will happen when Jesus comes again. Revelation 21.5 says, He that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, these things are true and faithful. Put this down. I'm making everything new. That includes the heavens and the earth. I'm making everything new. Now, when will this happen? This is going to happen at our Lord's return. Which, again, was what 2 Peter 3, 10 through 13 says, and it reasons with us about this. <clears throat> the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise. The element shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein will be burned up. Seeing that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought we to be in all conversation or manner of life and godliness? Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens shall be on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to the promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness. So for the child of God, this is not a hopeless consideration. Where we are now is going to go. With it, of course, thank God, all the things connected with it, like trouble and pain and sorrow and death, they're, they're all going to go too. They're all going to pass away with the earth. Now, what kind of people should we live? What kind of people should we be in view of that consideration? The scriptures tell us that the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire. And all it's going to take is like a word from Christ and it's going to, it's going to happen. 2 Peter, the third chapter, verses 5 through 7. Listen to this rationale. For this, there are people that say the earth has always remained just as it was. Nothing new has happened. Everything's continuing like it's always been. And Peter says, This they are willingly ignorant of, that the, by the word of God the heavens were of old, that's Genesis 1, and the earth standing out of water and in water, that's the creation of Genesis 1. God's word caused that. Verse 6, Whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. So there's another change that happened. First, the creation brought into being, the flood washed everything away, changed the face of the earth, Verse 7, and but the heavens and earth which are now by the same word, that's the word that created them, the word that destroyed them with the flood, by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire, against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. 
So like this sentence that's been passed upon creation is not going to be abrogated. It's not going to be pulled back. It's not going to be nullified or postponed. <laughs> it isn't going to happen. It's just a matter of time. And this is going to happen. He's going to speak the word and the heaven and earth that now are are going to be consumed with fire. That's what he said. Now, this may create theological problems for some people, but this is what he says. And people must just be willing to accept this. And it's, it's going to be purged by fire. It's, as I understand, it's going to be a purging fire. See, the world has been... God baptized the world once. In Noah's day, he baptized it with water. He's going to baptize it with fire the next time. When Jesus comes. In other words, when Jesus comes again, there's no reason for the earth as it is now to remain. There is no reason for it. Amen. Once he leaves heaven, the intercession is done. That's it. Just as sure as when the high priest left the most holy place. When he walked out of there, the intercession was done. It was over. And when Jesus leaves heaven, well, Acts 3, 20 and 21 says the heavens must retain him until the time of the restitution of all things spoken by the mouth of the holy prophets since the world began. So Jesus is staying in heaven till every word's been fulfilled and he's leaving. That's it. The world's going to pass away as it is now. And the fullness of it, that even everything in it's going to pass away too. So God's word created the world. God's word brought the flood. God's word's going to consume it with fire. When ultimate, when this ultimate reality, when Christ is seen as he ultimately is in all of his glory, everything that competes with that glory will be consumed. It will not be able to survive. We know this is the case because when God was speaking with Moses, Moses asked God, show me your glory. Mm -hmm. He said, no man can see my face and live. Mm -hmm. you can't, no, no one in the flesh can come close to God without dying. It can't happen. That's why he had to cover Moses in the cleft of the rock. That's why when he appeared on Sinai, he appeared in as smoke and fire and hail and tempest. That's why. Because the world couldn't survive his appearance. When Jesus died, the earth, there was such an earthquake and that some graves were opened up. And nature just about fell apart right there. The closer sinful personalities are contaminated things get to God, the more in jeopardy they are. Serious, serious. So uh, when Jesus comes in all of his glory, there's going to be nothing to protect Whoever's not reconciled to God, whatever's not pure in God's sight, there'll be nothing to protect him mm -hmm. when the glory of God is revealed in Christ. No long suffering, no mercy at that time. See, this is the age of mercy right now. Mm -hmm. Amen. It will not be then. <clears throat> so when the ultimate glory is revealed, then uh, nature as we know it, it, this day is over. Matthew 16, 27 states, The Son of Man shall come in the glory of His Father with His angels. And then, then, He will reward every man according to His works. Mm -hmm. And while this is going on, or the day of judgment is happening, there will be no distracting factors. Yeah. <laughs> you know, here in the world, you can be in the presence of some great word from God or some great consideration. There's distracting factors. There's other things called for your attention, but this won't happen. When Jesus comes again, there's going to be nothing, distra no distracting factors. No competing influences will be there at all. Matthew 24, 30, he shall, Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Then, then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. What are you going to do then, Jesus? He'll send his angels with the sound of a great trumpet. They shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. That's what he's going to do. There isn't going to be any earth as we know it right now. Divine glory interrupts nature. It interrupts the course of things. Now you can experience this, you can kind of get a pledge of this in your own heart. When you become acutely conscious of God, you become very ill at ease with sin. Mm -hmm. Now you, you just check your own self with this. When you become, and you're very conscious of God, you're very aware of 
him and his will and his person, whatever, sin becomes very, you're very ill at ease in that kind of environment. That's just a kind of a small token of what's going to happen when Jesus comes in all of his resplendent glory. Revelation 20 and verse 11, John said, I saw a great white throne, him that sat upon it, I saw him, I saw him from whose face, from before whose face, the heavens and the earth fled away, and no place was found for them. That's, the word, that's what Peter was talking about, 2 Peter 3, 10 through 12. Just won't be able to survive. Then Daniel's prophecy will be brought to an ultimate fulfillment. Remember he saw a little, a little stone kind of fell out of the mountain without hands. And the stone began to roll. And the more it rolled, the bigger it got. And, and this stone struck an image that Daniel was told represented the great kingdoms of the world. And it drowned the image to powder. And the stone became a mountain that filled the whole earth. It wasn't any other mountains competing with it. It wasn't one of the great mountains of the earth. It filled the whole earth. Well, that's what's going to happen when Jesus comes again. The mountain's going to fill <laughs> everything. Nothing will be left. Or as Revelation says it, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and His Christ. They'll be like under His feet. <coughs> no, there won't be, won't be any more resistance as men know now. So His coming will shake the natural order. This also is stated in Hebrews the 12th chapter, verses 26 and 27. Whose voice then shook the earth, that was at Sinai. Whose voice then shook the earth. I, I guess it did. That Sinai Peninsula lit up and even Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. It was a frightening experience, let me tell you. But now he has promised saying, yet once more, I will shake not the earth only, but also heaven. Well, that, that's what Peter said too. <laughs> and this word, yet once more signifies the removing of the things that are shaken as of things that are made or created that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. So the picture you get is that right now in Christ Jesus God's eternal kingdom is in existence now. It's just not perceived in the human eye. Nature has obscured the whole thing, but once nature is removed, there it'll be. It's been right under our nose all along. That's what Jesus meant in Luke 17 when he said, Men shall say, Lo here, lo there, the kingdom. He says, But the kingdom is within, or proper word is among. It's right, what Jesus was saying was, The kingdom is right under your nose and you can't see it. He said, well, now, If I with my finger cast out demons, the kingdom's right here. You can't see it, but when this world's removed, everybody will see it. Amen. It'll be plain. There won't Amen. be one single knee that won't bow. Mm -hmm. Not one. Not of angels, men, or demons. There'll not be one knee that won't bow. There'll not be one tongue that won't confess. And salvation is geared to prepare you for that time. That's what it's geared for. Now the question that Peter asks us in view of this ultimate removal of the heavens and the earth that will occur when he comes to the people of the night. And I'll give this to you. The New American Standard Bible says, seeing that all these things are to be destroyed in this way, that is sudden, undetected, you're not going to be able to shift gears suddenly you see it. You'll maybe see the heavens passing away and the earth being burned up and suddenly you change your mind, want to get in. Oh, this is, oh, this is not going to happen. This will not happen. If you're going to get in, you've got to get in before this happens. Amen. That's what salvation is geared to do. Seeing that all these things should be removed, destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness there? There it is. <laughs> Now, you know, I trust the answer of every honest person. I trust the answer. This is, you don't have to give people this answer. You don't have to reason about this. People here, the Holy Spirit dumps this right in the laps of people. It's like God says, now listen, I've told you that I'm going to destroy the heavens and the earth. 
that now are. I've told you they're going to pass away. I've told you it's going to be a, it's going to be a cataclysmic catastrophe when it happens. That the heavens are going to pass away with a great noise. And the elements are going to melt with fervent heat. And the earth's going to be burned up and everything in it. I've told you this is going to happen. I've told you it's going to happen suddenly. I've told you when it's going to happen. It's going to happen when my son is shown in all of his glory. Amen. Now you reason it out. What kind of people should we be then? How godly should a person really be? If this is the case, how godly should you be? How detached should you be from the world? The answer is all obvious. I don't want to really dwell upon this. But the fact, if people are not godly and are not prepared, there can only be one reason why they're not. They don't believe this that we've talked about. Yes. Now they may in their theology, technically, acknowledge it, but they don't really believe it. And of course we're living in a day when it's very rare that this is preached. I think I shared with you that after I'd been in this area for five years and I had personally preached in 160 different congregations. In every one of these congregations I asked this question. When was the last time somebody heard a focused message on the coming of Christ? After five years 160 congregations, I did not receive one single affirmation that anybody other than old timers talking about years past had heard someone expound the coming of the Lord. It's just not fashionable. If you go to the average Bible college and you look at the curriculum, I can guarantee you you will not find a course expounding the coming of the Lord. If you go to the Bible bookstore, the only books you'll find on Christ's return don't really have to do with Christ's return. They have to do with who's left behind or with the Antichrist or with some competing government or with signs preceding His coming. But none of them are dealing with the coming, with the actual return. Our text dealt with the actual return. Yes. Mm -hmm. He said, when it comes, nature's day as we know it mm -hmm. is over. Mm -hmm. Now, in view of that, the course of action for us is laid out. It's pretty simple. If you conduct yourself in this way, abstain from every desire that competes against God. It may be a moral desire. It may be a business desire. It may, it's just a lot of forms it can take, but where you come across a desire that tends to turn you away from this consideration, that is a, that's a lethal desire. You're on dangerous territory because you don't know when Christ is going to return. He hasn't get bothered to give us a schedule of when this is going to happen. It's going to happen suddenly, in a twinkling of an eye, and when it does, if you're ready, you will be happier than you've ever been before. Amen.